Hello and welcome to Bendigo SDA Live. G'day Darren, good to have welcome. you here with us. Thank you, good to be here. And Hello, uh, for those, yeah, for those who don't know me, uh, my name is Daniel Maher, I'm Minister here at Bendigo SDA and uh, yeah, we are back on the internet and uh, at least praise God we can be here together. We have yes. some experience in this now, don't we? <laughs> yeah, one week on, one week off it seems at the moment. Pretty much, yeah. So with all the things going on in the world uh, at, at large and also in, in our little worlds around us, I think Darren is Darren is just, just in a moment, he's going to say a prayer for us. Um, I think we'll, we'll have a hymn first. But if you've got any prayer requests, please put them in the comments. Um, Jason is joining us. Welcome back, Jason. Uh, on Jason. the other side, on the other side of things today. So it's great to have you here watching with us. Yeah, so if you've got any prayer requests, please uh, please share them. Uh, maybe, Darren, you can you can start us off with a couple. Oh, I think a few as well. Yeah. Yeah, well, look, we, you know, we, we're, a, we're a church family and um, we have a number of sick people, um, those that are unwell or, um, yeah, need our prayer. And, you know, like any, any family, they mean a lot to us and we want to pray for yeah. their well-being. Um, yeah. Morning, Owen. Morning, Owen. Yeah, that's right. So one of our, one of our sisters, Pam, um, we've had some good news about her, I think. She, she was quite unwell, but um, maybe she's on the road to recovery. But now her husband um, yeah. has had an accident. And, uh, yeah, it's just it's one thing after another, isn't it? Yeah, man. So we want to, want to remember that. Yeah, that's right. So yeah, share your share your prayer requests, and uh, we will um, we'll pray in just a moment. But first of all, let's uh, oops, let's sing together. Uh, we're going to sing. Sorry about the last minute change. We're going to sing 108 Amazing Grace. Um, let's sing along uh, as we have our old um, our old thing that we made last year. Fix that again. Let's sing together. Amazing grace. Oh, 
Well, that's a good song. So, um, we also have a request from Bev. Bev says, good morning, everyone. Please pray for Meg and Chris from Castlemaine Church. Aaron, make note of that. Yep. Yeah. So there's a lot of things we can pray about. So we've got some of our, our local brothers and sisters who are not well. Um, also, uh, we know there's things going on in the world that are scary. Obviously, COVID is one thing, all the lockdowns, um, and also um, uh, what's happening in Afghanistan. Um, mm. We need prayer and also brave people who are doing doing things about that. So praise God for those. Um, yeah. Praise God for all the people who are willing to put themselves in harm's way to help others. Mm. Yeah. Any other prayer requests, send them through. Um, oh, I should also add, uh, a bit later on, just before um, I preach the message uh, today, we're going to have not one children's story, but two. Uh, one will be just a nature lesson that I'll share. The other one will be a special little uh, movie that we'll be premiering here. Um, so it's it's six minutes long, so don't imagine it's going to be a three-hour movie. But, um, yeah, it's uh, it's all right. It's all right. And it's our first attempt. So hang in and uh, and watch that. And then once you finish that, then I'm going to have to try to uh, – then I'm going to have to try to get all your attentions back because uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm probably not going to be quite as interesting as, as the movie is. But. Anyway, I'll, I'll hopefully have something to share. We're talking today about the 144,000. So that's that's an interesting topic, and I've learned something preparing it. Um, so maybe we'll all learn something. Yes. All right. Well, Darren, I think it's time. Um, I'll let pray? you. Yeah, I'll let you pray and also share yeah. us a Bible reading. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, maybe let's pray first, and then we'll. We'll share the Bible reading after. Sure. Lord Father, we we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the Sabbath day, Lord. And as we have just uh, met and discussed it, Lord, we we acknowledge um, that you are Lord of the Sabbath, and we thank you that we can meet with you, meet with each other, Lord, and just um, come a, come apart from the world at this time. Lord, we want to um, pray this morning. For those who are unwell, particularly, um, Lord, we want to first thank you for Pam, um, but also continue to pray for her, Lord, and also want to pray for her husband Max, who who's been involved in a in a in a serious accident. And Lord, we we leave him in your hands, and we pray for him for his health. We pray that you would restore him, Lord. Uh, Lord, also this morning, um, uh, the names of Meg and Chris from Castle Maine have been mentioned. So, Father, we want to uh, pray for them. Pray that you would uh, walk with them, that you would hold them, um, heal them, support them, guide them, whatever they need, Father, we pray that, that you will be with them. And, Lord, we have many in our congregation, in our church family, who are also uh, in need of you, as we all are, Lord. And we pray that, that you would be with um, each and every one of us, Father, that you would comfort us, heal us, um, provide our needs, Lord, as we know that you do. We thank you for those many blessings that we take for granted. Lord, the fresh air, the the safety outside. We can, we can walk outside without fear. Lord, we look around this world and, and even places like Afghanistan that have been on the news at the moment, Lord, and we just wonder how how the world can be so evil but we know these are the things that must happen but lord we pray for those people we're we're all so comfortable over here lord but may we acknowledge that that we are blessed because of that and we pray for those people we pray for those who are trying to um get these people to safety um, lord may your hand be over all of that lord i pray this morning also for daniel as he shares the word I pray that we may be blessed by it, Lord, and I thank you that we can come together and partake of this sermon this morning. And so, Father, we, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for all you have done for us. We thank you that, that so soon you were coming to, to take us home with you and that all this evil, this hardship, this sickness, all of it will be just a distant memory and, and we can spend our time with you lord we look forward to these things and we just thank you father in your loving name amen
Amen. Amen. Thank you, Darren. Okay. Well, Amen. if you've got kids, make sure you bring them. Um, we're going to have, first of all, a nature lesson, um, which is for everyone. Uh, uh, it's all for everyone. And uh, then we'll be going into our little children's movie. Uh, we'll go straight in there, and then from then I'll, I'll preach. So, thanks, Darren. See you on the other side. No worries. Thank you. Nobody's perfect, but if you look at this pine cone, it's perfect. Look at the pine tree behind me, it's perfect too. It does, uh, it does what it's meant to do. It makes the right kind of leaves, the right kind of flowers, the right kind of pine cones. They all work just as they're supposed to do. So why do we say no one's perfect? Don't we just do what we're supposed to do as well? Well, no, the truth is that we're flawed. We have something called sin. We uh, choose to do things that are not according to what we were made to do. But if we ask Jesus into our hearts, if we put our trust in him, then we too can be a child or a grown-up. You are perfect as long as you have Jesus in your heart. Now, that doesn't mean we can't improve. Even this pine tree here can get bigger. Even this pine tree here can produce more uh, fruit. Perfection isn't about having nothing more left to grow. We all have more to grow, except God himself, perhaps. Perfection is about right now being who you need to be. And only Jesus can give you that. If you have Jesus in your heart, you are perfect. So let's ask Jesus into our hearts now, so that we can be perfect too. Dear Jesus, please be in our hearts and make us perfect. Make us like this pine tree uh, that we might do exactly what it is that you want us to do and that we might do it not through our effort but through the power of the Holy Spirit working in us through Jesus Christ and I pray this in Jesus name amen thank you everyone we'll see you next time for another nature lesson Hey, is everyone ready? It's our holiday today. Ooh, coming. I'm ready. We're going on an adventure. That's everyone, isn't it? Is anyone missing? Ooh, ready now. Follow me. I know the best part to have the most fun. <laughs> isn't Chicken coming? She's too busy. She's making a house to lay some eggs in. I'm sure I had some help to get this done. It'll take all day and I'll miss out on going with my friends on the adventure. This stick is so heavy. We can't wait. We'll get the best views this time of year. It's now or never. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Let's just get going. Mm, okay, that's fine. Let's go. <laughs> Look at this pine tree. What a perfect view! There's an even better view further along. Woohoo! This is what adventures are! Not much further. Come on, keep going. Look at all these flowers. They're perfectly beautiful. Hey, look, there's Noah's Ark. <laughs> Great day for a trot. Can't stay. Look, there's our view. That's what I call a perfect view. <laughs> Look over there, the sea. 
Let's go for a swim! Ooh, this is fun! I'm cold. Ooh, look, there's Camel. He's fishing. Hey friends, nice day for fishing. Let's dry off on the swing of the wind. I'm cold. Let's dry off on the rocks of the sun. There's a broken down car. <laughs> Let's walk over there. Look there, a cave. Mm, nothing special about this cave. I beg your pardon, this is my home. Ooh, we meant no offense. Mm, begging your pardon, young fellow. I admit it's nothing to the great hole over there. Thank you, friend. We should have a look at that. We're having an adventure. Wow, this is the biggest hole I ever saw. Ooh, watch out, big. It's a bit Stay slippery. back from the edge, everyone. Ooh, Ooh, stay, stay back, back big. Oh, I'll save you. Ooh, I'm slippery. Me too. Ooh, oh, my treasure. Oh. Okay, pig, lion. I'm okay, mostly. Where's Cap? Mm, she's under the ashes. Quick, pull her out. Mm, I don't feel so good. <laughs> are you all okay down there? How are we going to get out? Mm, more ashes fall in every time we move. Are you okay down there? We really could use some help, actually. Here, grab this rope. It's strong enough for all of you. Everyone up. I'll come help. I'm nearly there. Soon you'll have more horsepower. Oh, you're all up. That's everyone, hooray. Thank you, Mr. I'm not sure I've met you before. I'm just an old fella that's seen a lot of things. Not to worry, mates. Lending a hand is my favorite kind of adventure. A real hero. It would be fun to help someone too. Ooh, what about chicken? You're right. Let's go now. Hey, chicken. Can we help? <laughs> We're sorry we didn't help you earlier. <coughs> I'm just glad you're here to help. Ooh, where do I put this? Thank you so much, friends. The house is finished. We all had the most fun when we helped each other. Wow. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> that was Steph's, Steph's production. Wow. Well done. Well done. Darren. Well, I forgot to ask you to do the reading. Yes, but that's all right. We will do it now, won't we? Switch. Well, thank you. Thank you for that children's story. That was awesome. All right. <laughs> Our, our Bible reading this morning is, is just one text. It's, it's the first verse of Revelation 14. So Revelation 14, verse 1, and I'm reading from the NIV. Then I looked, and there before me was the Lamb, standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads.
Thank you, Darren. Thanks, Karen. Yeah, well, team effort. I'll take this off now. Hopefully you can still hear me. Now, at the risk of uh, boring you all too much, having just heard a, a fun children's movie, I want to talk about 144,000. Maybe it's a topic that is of interest to you. And if it is, I hope that you'll be able to uh, stick through to the end and hear it. And I've, I've called it the 144,000. And uh, I use the word thousand in there because it's an important word. When I studied this, I, I discovered. But let me first of all ask you the question. Have you ever been afraid that your ideas are weird? Have you ever been afraid that your ideas are weird? Yeah, thank you, Owen. Um, I'd actually be a bit worried about you if, uh, if you never have. Uh, that would, I think, perhaps show a little bit of a lack of self-awareness. I think we all have weird ideas sometime, and I certainly know that I often um, would worry about that. Jim says, yep, every day. Good on you, Jim. Self-awareness there. So those of us who are self-aware, sometimes we have a bit of a concern that maybe our ideas are strange, and um, many of us, I think, would be really glad to think that we could send a letter to a prophet and the prophet would be able to tell us whether ideas really are weird. Um, and I found a letter when I was preparing this sermon, and it was a bit of a coincidence that I found it, but it, I guess it's because it mentions 144,000 in it, so it's not a coincidence. But it's from a man called Brother Chapman to Ellen White, and if I just read you the letter, I think this will explain enough of, of what's going on here. So what I'm actually reading is Ellen White's response, but it has his letter, part of his letter in it. Brother Chapman. I have received yours dated June the 3rd. In this letter, you speak in these words. Elder Robinson uh -oh, does not wish me to leave, but urges that I enter the canvassing field until such a time as the conference can afford to employ me in some other capacity. But states positively that I cannot be sent out to present the truth to others until some points held by me are cha changed or modified in order that the views regarded by us as a people should be properly sent forth. He quotes as a sample, my idea in reference to the Holy Ghost not being the Spirit of God, which is Christ, but the angel Gabriel, and my belief that the 144,000 will be Jews who will acknowledge Jesus as their Messiah. On all fundamental points, I am in perfect harmony with our people, but when I try to show what seems to me to be a new light on the truth of those in authority, none of whom have seemingly ever made a personal investigation of the matter, Refuse to look into the Bible, but brand me as a fellow with queer ideas of the Bible. That's letter seven, 1891 uh, to Brother Chapman. Now, I just find that a very interesting illustration of a, a case where maybe someone actually should have had a bit more self-awareness. Maybe he had some weird ideas, but he was he felt that he was in the right and the church was in the wrong and um, he wanted to get Elamite to back him up. So. What I find very interesting about the rest of Elamite's letter to him is that she only makes one reference to the 144,000, and it's just the vague reference to say, I don't think you're right about it, um, but I haven't really got anything to say. And that's really fascinating because as a church, we, we often have opinions about the 144,000. So why is it that Elamite didn't have an opinion? Well, for those that heard my message not so long ago, um, you probably realize that Ellen White knew that if she made a comment and God hadn't actually told her anything, people would treat it as scripture and um, it would create problems down the track. So it was wise of her not to do that. But I do want to follow in her example just a little bit and say, all right, well, I'm not going to just share my opinion, but I'm going to look at scripture. And based on scripture, what can we know about the 144,000? Uh, there's many places where Ellen White, for example, uh, warns not to get too tied up in some aspects of it, but it's in the Bible for a reason. And I want to study it today because in the, the next few weeks or the next, next few sermons, I'm going to be talking about the three angels' messages and the 144,000 are very important context for this. 
So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to look in Revelation 7, and uh, you can join me there, Revelation 7, verse 1 to 8. Um, I probably won't read all eight verses um, because you get the idea of it pretty quickly. Um, and this is the first time that 144,000 is mentioned in the Bible. So what does it say? Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 to 8. And I'll probably just, um, et cetera, when we get to a certain point. After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth or on the sea or on any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. Of the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Gad, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Asher, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Levi, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Issachar, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Joseph, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 were sealed. Now, I did actually read the whole thing. And in some ways, it's worth doing it, just reading through, because when you read it and you actually just read it, what stands out the most? Does 144,000 stand out the most? It's only mentioned once. What stands out the most? Well, I just thought I would go and count some of the most frequent words because, you know, I don't want to just read my traditions uh, or my previous understanding that, you know, I, I've told other people um, even until recently. I don't want to just force that onto the text. Um, and um, so I counted some of the words. Now, what do you think was the word that came up the most? Now, put it in the comments if you think, you think, you've, if you think you've got it. Um, it's in a couple of different forms, but what was the word that came up the most in this passage? While you're um, counting words and, and thinking, um, while you're thinking about it, let me just also mention something else about this passage that you may not have noticed before. When it begins, chapter 7, verse 1, it says, after these things I saw for angels. Now, that phrase, after these things, occurs a few times in Revelation, maybe maybe four. I haven't counted all of them necessarily, but I, I noticed four of them. And every time it seems to be a very specific, it's like a new part of the vision. Um, it most Sometimes it says, and I saw, and I saw, now I saw. That kind of thing. It says that over and over again in Revelation. But in, in this chapter, it says, after these things. I saw. It's like he's trying to say that this is not, you shouldn't take this as a part of what came before. This is a unique section. Um, and interestingly, as soon as it's finished with what I just read, it says after these things, it does that break again. Um, so I've always connected verse eight and verse nine as being directly part of the same vision, but maybe they're not. Maybe the great multitude in verse nine are not actually um, the same as, uh, as a, sorry, I'm not a part of the same vision as the 144,000. All right, so we've got some answers coming through. Um, so Tarina and Troy say, it's interesting that the tribe of Dan isn't listed. Um, that's right, I take it quite personally. Um, let me just quickly say, you know, you probably heard this before, but um, there's two tribes not mentioned, Dan and Ephraim. They were the two tribes that had the golden calves um, during the time of the kingdom of Israel. I don't know if that's the reason why they're left out, but um, it's certainly a good reason. Um, Swan Hill um, Church device uh, says, happy Sabbath from Swan Hill. Happy Sabbath, friends. Uh, you're very welcome here. And um, thank you for being part of the live stream. Darren says 12,000 um, comes up a lot. Kirk says, good morning. Happy Sabbath. Sealed. Um, and Jim says 12,000. Now, 12,000 does occur many times. It occurs, I think, uh, what is it? 12,000, 13 times, right? So the word 12 and 1,000 or maybe, you know, the two together occur 13 times. 
But the word sealed occurs 15 times. The word sealed or, or uh, you know, some form of that word, seal them, or they were sealed, occurs 15 times. So something about uh, sealing must be very important in this passage, right? And also 12,000 is important as well, or 12 and 1,000. Now, there are a couple of also honourable mentions as well. Um, obviously, 144 occurs once, but it is the overall um, theme of the, of the section. But also the word for comes up four times, and it's always in relation to the destruction of creation, um, God's, uh, God's judgment on sin. Now, these are all kind of interesting, but let's look at other parts of Scripture and um, we'll try to get an idea of, of what it means. I'm actually planning to talk more about sealing and being sealed uh, in the future messages, so we won't exhaust that topic today. But um, we are going to look at some um, simple enough references. So, for example, thousand. Uh, where can we find the word thousand in the Bible? Uh, we can find it a lot, obviously, but what are some examples of it? And what does it signify? What does it mean? What should we think of when we, when we hear the word thousand? So Genesis 24, verse 60 is our first one. So you're welcome to turn there, but um, I'm just going to be reading a little section. Uh, Genesis 24, verse 60. Maybe not one that you've, you've heard preached on before, um, but I think it's significant, especially in this context. Genesis 24, verse 60. And they blessed Rebekah and said to her, Our sister, may you become the mother of thousands, of ten thousands, and may your descendants possess the gates of those who hate them. All right. Okay. So mother of thousands, mother of ten thousands. Okay. Maybe that's significant. Maybe it's not. What about the next one? Exodus. Uh, 18 verse 25, and I'm not, I'm not reading every single reference of thousands, but I'm trying to give you a bit of a cross-section of what's there. Um, Exodus 18 verse 25, maybe you can do a word study on a thousand yourself sometime and tell me how you, how you go. And Moses chose able men out of all Israel and made them heads over the people, rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. Okay, so thousands are here. Um, rulers of thousands are the rulers of the greatest number of people. And then just over the page, Exodus 20 and verse 6. Um, and I'll read a little bit of verse 5 too. Exodus 20 and verse uh, 6 and a bit of 5. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me, and keep my commandments. So, once again, the judgment of God is on is four something to do with four, and um, I'm not saying that's all that means, but that's interesting. But then, mercy, the mercy of God, is to thousands. So, when I look through at the Bible and try to look for what the significance of thousands is, I see over and over again, in general, it's a big number. It's, you know, 10,000s is kind of, you know, bigger, obviously, but thousands is frequently used for a very big number, but not just a big number, but a big number in relation to God's people. Now, maybe you feel like, well, you haven't really told me anything. I, I kind of already knew that this would be God's people. Um, and, of course, we know 12, you know, the 12 tribes as well. What I'm getting at is if this was not a literal number, and I'm not saying it isn't, who knows? But if it's not a literal number, if it's a symbol, it would make a lot of sense because 12,000 would be a complete set of many, many of God's people. And then 12 of that would be an even more complete set. So already what I'm seeing here is that there's an emphasis here not only on ceiling, but on vastness, large number. To us, 144,000 seems like a small number uh, because we're used to thinking in millions and billions and trillions. Um, but for them at the time, this wouldn't have seemed like a small number. And I actually would argue that based on scripture, it's supposed to reflect a very big number, a very big number of God's people. So 144,000, a very big number of God's people. Um, maybe we could even say a complete number of God's people. 
But let's look at the other reference in the Bible. And it's actually fairly easy to remember where it is because um, 144,000 are in Revelation 7, a uh, familiar number, which um, is not used in that chapter. But Revelation 14, so double seven, is where we find the other reference to 144,000. There's just two. And uh, Revelation 14, and we'll read from verse uh, 1 to verse 5. Revelation 14, 1 to 5. So let's put up, let's put up that. So we've got uh, Genesis, we had Exodus, and the other one in Exodus. All right. So Revelation 14, uh, verse 1 to 5. Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his fa father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing on their harps. They sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who were not defiled with women. For they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Now, there's a lot that we could look at here, and, and I'll just very quickly touch on a few things, but I want to focus um, on one of these verses in particular to do a bit more research in Scripture. And one of them, I think, that often uh, trips people up a bit is verse four it says they who were not defiled with women so and but they were virgins now people say oh that means 144,000 are all people who've never been married or something um well i'm pretty sure that word virgins in the original language even just as much as in modern english generally refers to women rather than men and yet the previous verse says that they're not defiled with women so once again, in the Bible, generally speaking, when it's talking about being defiled with women, it's not primarily concerned about sex or anything like that. It's primarily talking about spiritual defilement, about going after other other gods, I, other idols, making kings of the earth your um, your god instead of, of your god. So, you know, once again, not to say that purity and sexual things is not important, but the primary purpose here is probably not to talk about that, but to talk about spiritual purity. So, yeah, is it just talking about people who've never been married? I don't think that's very likely. Um, it also says they uh, the first fruits. So once again, does that mean that they're fruit? No, it means that they are a, you know, an example, that they're a testimony to the greatness of God. So what else? Um, the Father's name written in their foreheads. Now, once again, we're going to talk more about this later. This is related to the idea of being sealed. But the verse that I particularly want to look at, which is the one that I've had the most puzzling about, is verse 5. And that is where it says, And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. So is this verse saying that the 144,000 are a special group of people who have no sin? And now I'm not actually talking today about the topic of whether it is possible for there to be a special group of people who perhaps exist right at the end of time when Jesus comes, who will be without sin. I don't think that those who are faithful to God, you know, in prison or in the caves or whatever, when Jesus comes, are going to be in the middle of sinning right when he gets there. So to me, I think that's a bit of an academic discussion. The important thing is not whether there will be some people in the future. The important thing is what is Jesus telling us today for our own relationship with him? Does he expect us to be perfect and blameless in our own strength right now? Because who knows when he may come? He may come at any time. So we should be ready. So what is it saying? When it says, in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Let's not look to tradition to get the answer to this. Let's look to scripture. What does scripture say about being without fault before the throne of God? Let's turn to Philippians, uh, chapter 2, verse 15 to 16. And um, these are just a couple of texts that I'm going to share that have exactly the same language, right? exactly the same language here. And um, Philippians, oops, flipping to Philippians, 
Oh, I should say Philippians is uh, one of the epistles of Paul. Um, it is before Colossians, which we'll also turn to, and it's after Ephesians. So it's sort of in the middle there of Paul's epistles after Romans and, and the Corinthian epistles. All right. So Philippians 2, 15 to 16. That you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or laboured in vain. So, all right, let's... Let's think about this, but then let's go to the next text because I want to look at them both and I want to try to get context as to what it is that we're really talking about here. Go to Colossians now. Colossians, it's just a couple of pages over, so you can easily flip back and check uh, Philippians to see if, if what I'm saying is true. Um, Colossians chapter 2, um, sorry, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 21 to 23. Colossians 1, 21 to 23. And you, who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. If indeed you continue in the faith grounded and steadfast and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. That's Colossians 1, 21 to 23. So once again, this idea of perfection and blamelessness, what is it attached to? What is the common thread in both of these texts? And once again, I'm not saying that Jesus doesn't have the power to make us blameless. That is exactly what these verses are saying. The question is, what is it that makes us blameless? Is it us? Is it our own righteousness or our own um, self-control or our, our will or just, you know, we just try hard enough. What is it that makes us blameless? And strangely enough, um, or maybe not so strangely, you can also find here in Colossians uh, chapter 3, verse 14, um, a similar concept which links it back to sealing, I believe. Um, if you look at uh, Colossians 3, 14, the Bible says, but above all these things put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Now, um, that word bond can mean a lot of different things, but I think there's a sense in which the word bond can be related to the word seal. And so in the context anyway, love is the thing that makes us perfect. That's the point that it's saying. So if we want to be perfect, if 144,000 are perfect, then what, what, how do we do that, right? Well, love, that's the first answer, and we will talk more about that in the future messages. Um, but what else? What does it specifically say? All right. So what are the common points between uh, Colossians 1, uh, 21 to 23 and Philippians, um, Philippians 3, uh, sorry, Philippians 2, uh, 15 to uh, 16? What are the common points? What is it? What is in both of these texts? What is it? What is the emphasis of it? All right. So the first point that I would like to highlight for you is that in both cases it is being written to sinners, right? It's not being written to people who are without sin. Once again, I'm not saying that people can't become uh, without sin. Obviously, we believe that that will happen after Jesus comes back, so I don't see why it can't happen before. But the point is that this is written to sinners. It is sinners being addressed here, not sinless people. And what does it say to them? It says that they are being transformed by Jesus and his sacrificial love his willingness to die for them, his love for them, the Holy Spirit working on them, all this. It's not that they in their own strengths are making themselves better people. They are being transformed by Jesus and his sacrificial love, his sacrifice on the cross, his resurrection, the Holy Spirit, all of it. They're being, sacri they're being transformed by that. And not only that, they are living in a sinful world. So once again, this is not talking about you know, the millennium or the future or heaven or whatever. This is talking about right now. Right now, we are living in an evil world. And when Jesus comes back, just before he gets back, the world will be an evil world still. That won't, that won't have changed. And so the same 
uh, transformation that Jesus is working in our hearts now, he will work then. And perhaps because of the intensity of the struggle, there'll be an even greater spiritual uh, development and growth for us. But the point is that this still applies to those of us who are living right now in this evil world. We are sinners and we need Jesus to transform us. What else do we see in both these texts? In both these texts, there's a reference to witnessing. There's a reference to the gospel. There's a reference to preaching. We have a message. We have a purpose. We're not simply uh, just now I'm saved and that's great and now I'm just counting off the days until I'm going to be with Jesus. No, we have a mission. We have a purpose. We are the light to the world. We are supposed to reveal the character of God, not simply tell people what it is, but to actually live it, to actually by the things that we do, by the example that we set. And once again, but how can we do that when we're sinners? Well, that's Jesus' job. He is transforming us. It is for us, and this is another common point in both texts, to be faithful because of our hope in Jesus. It is our hope that Jesus will come, that keeps us faithful to him, that keeps us dependent on him, and as long as we are doing that, he will transform us. He takes responsibility for that, but it is for us to put our trust in him. And that's not easy. Trusting is, is not necessarily the easiest thing. Um, sometimes in life, all we're called to do is to trust. Um, and sometimes people betray our trust, but Jesus will not betray our trust. So the 144,000, can we be part of them? What does the Bible say? Can we be one of the 144,000 and how? I think the answer is right here in Revelation 14, verse 3. Revelation, back to Revelation, chapter 14, verse 3, being a part of the 144,000. They sang, as it were, a new song before the throne before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. So next time we're going to talk about the rest of this chapter um, from verse 6 onwards and, and so on. But in verse 3, it sounds like it's making an exclusive claim. It sounds like it's making an exclusionary claim. Uh, those who are not a part of the elite, those who are not a part of the holier than thou. Those who are not a part of the special group, oh, you know, that's me or, or that's not me, I'm not that great, that's him or her. That's what it sounds like to us. But if we read it in the context of Scripture, what is it actually saying? It's saying that every one of us who have been redeemed by Jesus, and I'm pretty sure we can all put up our hands to say, yes, I'm a sinner, and therefore, I need to be redeemed by Jesus. And so we can be one of the 144,000 because these are those who were redeemed from the earth. And they are the ones, we are the ones who can sing this song. What is the song? What is the song that only we can sing? Is it that I am so much more holy than everyone else? Is that the song? Is it the idea that... Uh, I happen to live at a later period of history and so I'm better. Is that, is that what it's about? It just, when you, when you think about it, it doesn't make any sense. Or maybe thinking about it doesn't help it to make more sense. But when I just looked at the scriptures, when I looked at what it actually says, and I, I tried to understand it from other parts of scripture, it makes so much more sense. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe one of you can show me that I'm wrong and I'd be happy to, to hear and to understand better. But it seems to be saying that the 144,000 is not a narrow, exclusive group. It is an embracing group, an all-inclusive group. It is Jesus wanting to save all of us, everyone. Jesus wanting to embrace everyone. The thousand is saying it's a big number. It's the biggest number. The 12 is saying it's God's people. The 12 times 12 is saying it's not just God's little people in Israel. It's, it's, a, it's a massive uh, multiplied group of people. This is, this is big. And Jesus is saying, I want to redeem you from your sin. I want to redeem you from 
your current situation. I want to redeem you from this evil world. The judgment is coming on the world. God will not allow wickedness and evil to prosper forever. And, and that's what those, those first few verses of, of Revelation 7 were talking about. There will be a judgment, but Jesus isn't wanting to judge you in a condemning way. Jesus is wanting to include you in his 144,000, his army, his people, his kingdom, the people who he will take to be with him for eternity. No one could sing that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. You know, we have a we have a duty. We have a mission. We have a privilege. We we have a blessing that we can enjoy as part of of this 144,000. Thank you, Jim. And in some ways, maybe I can't really put it better than um, one of our sisters who, who shared this. Let me read this from our Facebook group. One of our sisters just shared this. I think it was this morning. Um, Kayleen Munford. Thank you, sister. She shared this. I kept hearing this in my sleep last night. Look to heaven for peace and happiness, not to the minds of men. Just felt I needed to share that. God bless. Now, to me, it's not just the message. Look to heaven for peace and happiness, not the minds of men. That's, that's, that's what it's about. That's what the 144,000 is about. That's what the three angels' messages is about. But also the fact that she shared it. I bet she was a bit worried when she shared it that someone might say, oh, what are you trying to say? Who are you trying to, who do you think you are? Let's not worry about that. Let's not worry about people questioning who we think we are. Let's not worry about people questioning why do you get to say this and not someone else? We're all there is. If we don't say it, who will? Only the 144,000, only those who have been redeemed by Jesus can share this message that the world needs to hear. And so we need to, we need to take it to the world. We need to tell people about it, however we can do it. Maybe that's different for all of us. We all maybe have a different way that we can share. Maybe that's preaching. Maybe it's um, approaching people on the street, but maybe it's different. Maybe it's telling a friend. Maybe it's uh, simply posting something on Facebook that is positive and affirming and reminds people of what really matters, something that God has put in your heart. Uh, maybe if we spend less time uh, trolling each other on, on social media and making fun of each other and more time pointing each other to Jesus, Maybe even Facebook wouldn't be such a horrible place. <laughs> imagine, imagine that. And that's, that's it. That's my message for today. Like what Kayleen Mudford said in that message, look to heaven for peace and happiness, not to the minds of men. If God has put something on your heart to share, then share it. Don't let anyone hold you back. Share it. We need to share with each other the thing that God has put in our hearts. And so I ask that that would be your song. I ask that that would be, uh, your experience, and that we're going to sing now. I love to tell the story. And as we sing, um, remind yourself, this is what it's about, telling the story of Jesus, telling the story of his love, telling the story of what he's done. But the angels can tell that story. That's not the story that the 144,000 have to tell. It's the story of what he's done in my heart. It's the story of what he's done in your heart. That is your story. And only you can tell that story, and you need to tell that story. So let's sing. And then we'll pray. Let's sing together.